Thank you, John. Okay, thank you. Everyone can hear me, I assume? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Karen. <laughs> Another one, Rudy? Mo gestured toward the tap as he looked at Rudy's eyes for response. Eh, I'm probably good, Mo, thanks. Rudolph lifted his eyes from his beer and looked around. A couple old timers staring at their beers. A table full of polar bears in the back arguing about hockey and the Pittsburgh Penguins. Yeah, probably time to go home. He slopped down the last swallow of his warm beer and laid a bill on the bar. Merry Christmas, Mo. He tried to be happy as he head out toward the door. Yeah, you too, Rudolph. Merry Christmas. Christmas Eve, kind of a lonely time for an old reindeer. Did he really want to go back to Santa's workshop? Why, all those young bucks, they would just laugh at him and call him names. Hey, geezer, or grandpa's here. Well, it wasn't always like that. There had been some glory years, that's for sure. Why, one foggy Christmas Eve, Santa had come to him and said, Rudolph, with your nose so bright, won't you guide my sleigh tonight? And Rudolph had led the sleigh, led the team with his beautiful red nose. Oh, how the reindeer loved him. Damn. And the ladies, why, why every cow from Yukon to Lapland had left him to their scent. And before long, he would have them shouting out with glee. He had a pretty serious love affair with Dancer for a while, but his wandering ways trampled her heart. That was probably his biggest regret. Dancer, now many years a widow, had Five grandchildren had had three of her sons were in the prestigious Santa um, run tonight. Well, he went down in history, but that's what it was, history. In 95, he had blown it. Why, it was just a, just a little rambler in North Dakota the roof wasn't even steep. Like they did millions of houses with way steeper roofs. But Rudolph, because he was careless and flirting with the girls, he didn't position the sleigh properly. And when Santa jumped off and scrambled down the chimney, the sleigh shifted on the icy roof and started plunging toward the edge. To save the carefully packed presents, Rudolph jerked back. And he saved Christmas again, but this time not as a hero, but from his own stupidity. And his back was never the same again. He couldn't pull his weight. In 94, Santa asked him to step down from the Christmas ride. Rudolph thought that that would kill him, but 30 years later, he's still around. There'd been some tough times, painkiller addiction, alcohol, but somehow he'd found an equilibrium that allowed him to get through the day without hurting himself or hurting anyone else. He'd go down to Moe's in the afternoon, maybe have a couple, play some reindeer games, pool, dice, maybe some darts. Once in a while, he'd try to play cards with the with the polar bears but he had a hard time holding the cards with his cleft hoofs. Pool was his sport. The cleft hoof lined up the cue perfectly. <laughs> his red nose was now turning purple and his fetlocks were gray. Well he walked through the snow back to the workshop. And as he got there, he went to 
I really want to go in there. Everyone is bursting with energy and joy and I'll just be in the way. But when you open the door, the, the pure energy and love coming from that building overwhelms his self-pity. There were elves scurrying about, putting last minute finishes on last minute gifts. There were elves piling gifts into the sleigh. There are piles of gifts everywhere to be loaded. Reindeer surging in the harness with earnest, nervous energy ready to go. Santa with a twinkle in his eye and a glass of eggnog in his hand, merrily supervising it all. Mrs. Claus frantically trying to get Santa's attention because there was a little bit of his belly sticking out from that felt coat of his that had been added in the last year. And the children, the children, they were scampering, all the little reindeer and owls were scampering to and fro, chasing and laughing, playing hide and seek among the big piles of gifts, sneaking cookies, sneaking eggnog, even old Rudolph got caught up in the fun, nuzzling and giving them rides and making them laugh with his reddish purple nose. And then Santa was off. And the others, their duties done, gathered up their families and took off. And after a while, it was only Rudolph and four young reindeer the young reindeer told them proudly how their parents were pulling slant and sleigh, but they were waiting for their grandma to pick them up. Well, where was grandma? Rudolph told them stories and entertained them with his red nose and had them laughing, but one by one, they nuzzled into his fur and fell asleep. At about one, the door burst open Children, children, I'm so sorry. When the baby fell asleep, I must have fallen asleep too. Then she took in the scene. The old graying reindeer, the precious young ones, snuggled into his coat for warmth. Hello, dancer. Rudolph shyly looked at her. He was glad to see that her eyes registered warmth and not pity. Well, Rudolph, Rudolph, I am so sorry. Hey, no problem at all. I had fun with them. You've got some really nice grandchildren, Dancer. Rudolph helped Dancer bundle up the kids and took them to the door. He spoke up. Dancer, would you like to have a cup of coffee sometime? Yes, Rudolph, I, I think I would like that. Alone again, Rudolph pawed the best straw into his corner of the stable. Yeah, life was long and getting old was no glory. But Christmas, Christmas, Christmas is giving and sometimes even harder receiving. Christmas is innocence. Christmas is love. Christmas is opening up to receive all those things. But most of all, Christmas is children. Rudolph contentedly snuggled down further into his warming straw. Ah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, John, for that excellent story. I haven't heard that, so I'm imagining that this came from you. <laughs> our last speaker, and I put her as our featured speaker, and she said, oh, I don't want to be a featured speaker, but I told her she deserved it. So she is our featured speaker, and she's Judith Nickman. And Judith is, I like to think, a retired octogenarian. She recently moved from the Pacific Northwest 
in Washington to a teeny tiny town in Oklahoma. And she's loving it. She was widowed last year, so now she's spending her time writing and editing and maybe telling stories. Her presentation today is the $25 miracle. The $25 miracle, Judith Nakin. Yes, indeed. Uh, for future reference, if you don't, you know, hook me off and uh, never let me come back, it's Nakin, not Nakin. <laughs> Mine is a true Christmas story, every word. I'm okay. Yeah, I'm okay. okay. Yes, you're okay. You're fine. Somebody was muted. I don't have any background because we're still a construction zone in this new house, and this corner is my office, and the rest of this. Room is storeroom of boxes not unpacked yet. Anyway, this is a true Christmas story and it begins long ago and far away. Long ago in uh, December of 1969 when Ed Lewis was probably just screwing up his nerve enough to ask a girl for a date. The first of many, 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 many girls. And uh, and far away was Spokane, Washington. When you guys think of, of Washington, I'm sure you think of evergreens dripping with a relentless rain in the evergreen state because uh, it does in Western Washington rain all the time. But Washington is two different states. It's separated in the middle by the Cascade Mountains. And Spokane is on the side that has four seasons, winter, summer, all that. But it's mid-December, beyond mid-December, and it's cold and brown outside. And I'm six months sober, and I have lost the first job of my life. I got three young children at home. They're 12, 14, and 16. And I'm running out of money. Because I had been in Spokane such a short time, I had to draw on Californians' unemployment. And that was great because I'd get $53 a week out of California. And the, the limit in the state of Washington was only $42. So that 53 was gonna be very nice, but Christmas was coming and the checks weren't coming from California. I have about four bucks <laughs> in my purse, nothing in the bank and some flour and bacon and few stuff that I can make biscuits and gravy and things for the kids waiting for those checks. Um, Dorcas and I, when the boys were out one day, the, the daughter was the youngest, we uh, wrapped up what things I had already squirreled away in a linen closet in funny papers, one sock at a time for the boys of a pair of socks, you know, and we put them on the hearth. It was pitiful and there wasn't much, but uh, uh, a few days later, uh, I'll say, I don't know what day it was, but we'll say it was the 18th or 19th of December. It snowed, big snow, big snow. And uh, Douglas, the middle kid, got up real early and uh, went out with his snow shovel and worked all day knocking on people's doors and asking if they could have their snow shoveled. And uh, when he came home in mid-afternoon, he had five bucks. He was so proud. So he took the old sled and went down almost a mile to the Christmas tree lot down on Sprague Avenue. And in the meantime, I went to the mailbox. And in the mailbox, there was a, no other mail, just a beat up old white envelope. And I opened it up on the way back to the house and it had two tens and a $5 bill in it. 
two tens and a five dollar bill. My God, my head started thinking about all the things I could do with 25 bucks. Uh, visions of a little, little 33 cent turkey and stuffing and the fruit to make the family's famous heavenly hash for Christmas dinner. I looked, there were no footprints around the bottom in that pristine snow. I didn't know how it got there. I didn't know any of these people. I hadn't lived here long enough. I had very few, very few acquaintances in the whole of Spokane. So anyway, as I'm going back to the house, Douglas comes back. Yeah, it's getting dusk. He comes back pulling the sled with this Christmas tree on it. And he comes running in the house. I don't know where the other two kids were, but he and I were alone. He comes running in the house with this Christmas tree still out in the front yard, but he's got this, this uh, dime store sack under his arm. And he says, mom, I'm sorry I took so long, but I just wanted to get the very right tree. So I asked the guy where the $5 trees when he told me. So I went over there and I looked at every one of them till I found the one I knew would be perfect for us. And he said, I went back to the man and handed out my $5 bill. And he said, son, I hope your folks appreciate you as much as I appreciated watching you pick out that tree. You take that, it's a gift from me. And Douglas said, mom, I still had the money. So I just pulled the sled over to the dime store and, and uh, I got Dorcas a guitar strap and I got Marcus a book and I'm not telling you anything else. And he goes <laughs> marching down the hallway with, with his paper parcel. And somewhere the other children materialized and we brought the tree in and we decorated it with all the things that we had from the family for all the years that have gone by. And we sat at the piano and did our, our singing of 12 days of Christmas. The two, two young children with voices like birds and Marcus, my oldest, who couldn't carry a tune with his yellow turtle dolls was his part. And we decorated the tree. It was, of course, the finest tree we'd ever had. The next day, I went to the store and got the, I gave the kids each $5 to go shop again. And I bought $10 worth of Christmas groceries down at Albertsons. And then it was Christmas Eve. And Christmas Eve in the mail came three $53 checks from California. We didn't hardly even celebrate because we were already rich. Thanks. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judith, for that beautiful story. Yes, I remember miracles like that too. Well, I okay, everybody unmute because I want to hear your laughter on this closing joke. <laughs> Why did the turkey get excused from the table? For his foul language. <laughs> 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 Merry Christmas hey, and Happy Larry. New Year. Mark, and now Larry, I Mark, mean. Andy. Mark Beery had a, a joke. He says, where does the snowman keep his money? In the, In the bank. So that was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, do we know what's so next man. month? Uh, Joyce is next month. Oh, Joyce, that Joyce, quickly want to come up and say, and I'm sorry, I have to get out of here. My booster shot is right now. So thank you, Karen. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi. Next month, January is a path chosen. You can. It to me, it's when you.
you choose to go off in a direction, whether it's a long path or just a day, it's a choice you make. And I want you to share the choice and why you made it. So January, get in touch with me if you want to tell, have a good story. I have a new storyteller I'm excited to introduce, but I won't do it now. I'll do it next year. Next year. Next year. Uh, hey, what's the uh, what's the date? Because it's the fourth Saturday, right? It's it's the fourth Saturday. I think it's the twenty second. Am I right? Yes. yes. The twenty second. It is. It conflicts with the uh, <clears throat> Winter, Winter Festival, festival. Uh, but theirs is in the evening, I believe. Mostly. Mostly. And ours, of course, is in the afternoon. And unless something different happens, we will be both Zoom and in person, masks and vaccinated. Okay, thank you. One, one, one last joke since I have you on here. Um, this is another Larry joke. Um, what do elves learn in school? What do elves learn in school? The alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, Judah. Right. Thank Merry you. Christmas. Merry Christmas. This is Judas' first time telling a story. And Judith, this is Ed. How you doing? Um. Um. I'm. Uh, I'm okay. Actually, I had a terrible uh, reaction to my my uh, Moderna booster. I was so sick, it was unbelievable. And I never had any problem with the two original shots. So I'm just barely motating now, but uh, I was glad to be, I'm glad you talked me into this, Ed. Yeah, well, you're a natural storyteller. I hope to hear more stories from you, definitely. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll tell you about Osceola, South Dakota, population 50 sometime in the spring after I get settled, <laughs> after I get settled in this house. Hey, uh, there should be some stories there. Hey, Judy, oh, I guess. Tell, tell people about the books that you've written. I I don't often do that. That's why I didn't put it in my bio. But I do have five published books. Well, one self-published and four published published. And uh, wow. and if you remember my name, you can look them up on uh, on Amazon. Two of them are are. Uh, Memoir. In fact, I, I won the Reader's Digest memoir contest, memoir book contest, Reminisce Magazine in uh, 2015. Wow. That, uh, that uh, book is called Confessions of a Martian Schoolgirl. Because, you know, there are folks that stay in the box and folks that think out of the box. And I just, what box? You know, <laughs> so, so. Uh, and then there's three three works of fiction, so uh, take a look at them. Buy a book. <laughs> <laughs> it's Christmas. Buy a book. Thanks, thanks Ed. I'm getting off now. Okay. Bye. Nice job. Bye. 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 Okay. Guys. Love you, Judith. I know. Bill's Good on there see. too. Bill and Lori, they're on. Are they're they? On their iPhone. Good to see you. Bye bye. 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 Perfect. Yeah. Okay, guys. Bye. As you can see, our big crowd here now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you. And uh, Mark, it's a bummer we're not the uh, Auburn Winter Festival is on the same day, but hopefully we'll be able to get up there in the evening. And uh, she's still here. And I know Sherry got off when we were having those glitches, and so she never got to get back on. Hey, Andrew. I I think we ought to consider um, doing it on the following Saturday, but we can uh, talk about all that. I know. I think let's talk about that. I think yeah. that's probably a good idea because you got you're gonna be up there anyway, right? In Auburn. It's not live. It's Zoom. Oh, it's all in Zoom. Yeah. yeah. Oh, is it, is it a whole day too? Yeah, it starts at twelve with children's stories. One thirty. I'm gonna do a workshop. Uh, then it's a liar's open mic. And the children's storytelling is open mic also at 12, 12 to 1.30. At 1.30 to 3 is my uh, workshop for more beginning storytellers. And then 
there's a liars um, gathering. Anyone can share a story. And then in the evening, there's four amazing storytellers. I don't remember the exact time. Uh, Mark's on there. He can tell us. Uh, but there's four tellers. Yeah, yeah. Sheila Arnold, Ramya from India, who's been with us before, yeah. and uh, a couple others that are really great. So it's going to be a good lineup. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk some more. Yeah. All right. Any other announcements? Anybody want to make? Okay, well, good to see you. Thank you so much for telling great stories today. And um, I really enjoyed it. So take care, folks. See ya. See you later, Dave. We'll chat. All right, I'll call you, Ed. Talk to you guys later. Everybody have a nice Christmas. See you next month. Joyce. Joyce. Yes. All right. All right, bye-bye, guys.